Welcome everyone on the 144th episode on the Leaders Who Care. For most of you, I'm Marion and I'm on a mission to bring together some of the most caring leaders from every corner of the world and every industry to share their journey and um, the impact they do, that they do because success is very important to all of us, but how we achieve it is equally important. And today I have the privilege to welcome Nazomi Morgan, who is the CEO of intercultural leadership development firm uh, Michi Morgan Worldwide. We would love to hear more about this and host of um, Boundless Leadership Podcast, uh, offering multicultural organizational solution and more innovative uh, thought co-creation, collaboration and unleashing the collective wisdom. Nazomi, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, Marianne. It's so um, such an honor to be here, and I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Likewise, uh, and uh, I have a number of questions for you and really interested of what you do, um, why you do it, of course, but maybe a little bit of background for the audience. You were born and raised in Japan. Um, and uh, uh, you obviously am aware about uh, the Japanese uh, uh, ikigai and what you guys do and the, the purpose and what you um, what you follow. Love to hear more about your upbringing and uh, um, how did you really come to do your work today and uh, 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 of course the impact that you're creating. So there's quite a few things, but maybe tell us a little bit about your upbringing as well. Yeah. So as you said, Marianne, I was born in Japan. Uh, my parents are Japanese and my uh, my father's work, he worked for a Japanese corporation. And when I was about six months old, so, you know, a baby, my father's work uh, brought us to uh, the, uh, the U.S. And I lived in Seattle, Washington, which is on the west coast of the U.S. And so I was six months old. So that's my first memory uh, living in Seattle. And we lived there until I was eight years old. And then his assignment was done. And then we moved back to Japan. So I, my first memories are in Seattle, but um, uh I'm I'm much older now. <laughs> so that's when I was very, very young. So to be honest, at this point, um, I, I barely remember it. Everything that I remember is more photographic memory from like the old school mm -hmm. albums that I saw. Um, but I think for your listeners, I s probably sound very American. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, I thought you grew up in the States. And that's because I learned English at a very, very, very young age. Um, that which was a gift. Um, one of the you know gifts that I definitely received from my parents is is this language gift that because I know I tried to study other languages as a grown up, uh, which is very difficult. Um, anyhow, I digress. But uh, that's that's where my life started, and we moved back to Japan when I was uh, eight years old. And after that, I basically lived in Japan, um, and then. But it was very interesting, even at that uh, young age. It was such a cultural shock, you know, being in the U.S., um, the school, um, you know, you go to school wearing whatever you want, even um, like the the uh, in the U.S. they call P.E. classes, the physical yeah. ed classes. You you can you don't change into anything. You're basically wearing the jeans and T-shirts you know, even if you're running around the gym and all that, where when I went to the, you know, Japanese school uh, back in Japan, uh, which was my first time, you know, the moment that you walk into the building, it's different. You change from your outdoor shoes into indoor shoes. You have you in my school, um, we, we wore whatever you wanted to school that we didn't have a uniform um, for elementary school. But PE, you had PE clothes, you had, um, if you, you serve lunch by yourself, the, the kids will serve, um, you take turns, so you learn a lot of teamwork around that. Even um, cleaning in the US, you don't clean your own, you have a cleaning lady or a janitor, but in Japan, the students, the kids clean your own classroom. Like I said, you serve your own meal. Um, all of that. So it was very different. 
Um, so although I spoke the language because I uh, my parents are Japanese and, and they were really strict about, you know, making sure I spoke Japanese and I went to what we call Saturday school when I was in the U.S. Um, but that just the mentality is different. The way of navigating yourself is different. So I distinctly remember how uh, that cultural shock um, and I also know that's when I quickly learned how to read uh we, we say this in Japanese read the air so basically read between the lines so really observe and instead of you know um reacting really observe and study what is going on and then choose to take action because there are so many things I just had to learn um and even at that very young age I, you, it's amazing how you already learn like shame and being embarrassed. And those are things I did not want to experience. I didn't want to look like I didn't know what was going on. So um, good or bad, you know, there's always two sides to the coin. But I, I do know I learned that very quickly of how to figure out what's going on. The best way to do that was by observing. Um, I have a very... Uh, Cute, but sad episode around that time talking about observing. And so I wasn't really good at asking for help. So that I, I know that started at that around that age is um, so because I was only eight years old in third grade. So the Japanese language, you you uh, have, there are certain Chinese characters that you learn and each year you learn um, a set of them each year, like third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. And um, one day I really wanted to go to the bathroom, but I couldn't figure out where it was. So in my, in my uh, state of not wanting to look like I don't know what was going on, I held going to the bathroom the whole day and I ran back home. And I, you know, uh, uh, pressing the doorbell, really, you know, wanting my mom to come out as, as quick as possible. I think she was on the phone or something, but she was a second too late to open the door. And I just unleashed <laughs> at, the, at the front door. And then my mom wrote a letter note to the to the teacher the next day and say, please, you know, uh, tell her where the bathroom is. Uh, and Marion, guess where the bathroom was? Where? <laughs> it was actually right in front of the, my classroom. And I could not tell because the sign was written in Japanese, which I was too young to be able to read that certain um, letters. So all this time, it was right in front of me and I had no clue. And that has been a, a great lesson through my life is that a lot of times, you know, you, you, it's right in front of you. The answer is literally right in front of you. And, and really that power of one, the, the power of, kind of you, you used the word fear earlier, you know, how that um, really paralyzes you and how the, also the power of feeling embarrassed, how that again paralyzes mm -hmm. you and just asking one simple question opens up so many doors and the answer and, and, and the resources are right in front of you. Anyhow, that's, that's how, what I experienced great, when I was eight story. years old. Oh, thank you. Really, 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 <laughs> thank you for sharing. I mean, it's very incredible to see the, the growing up in two different, very different worlds. And interesting, yeah. Japan is the um, only nation from the Western uh, or let's say more developed really wealthier, uh, wealthy nations um, in the world that did not get obese. So the, the <laughs> that, that the Japanese, I think statistically, was five to 10 times better off. Like the US was something, I don't know the exact data, but it was more than 40%, whatever you call. In Japan was less than five. The UK was a bit better, over 20, Germany, etc. But it's just interesting to to see, and you've said something um, that was very different from school age. What makes it so different? What do you think is being on both sides, both systems that you like, and perhaps, um, you, you know, if you what you like in the Japanese, what you like in the US, so just to try to compare the, the things that are complementing each other. Yeah, so, um, 
It, it is true. Definitely in Japan, um, it, it, it is changing too. So yeah. um, I, I see, I do see more um, obesity in Japan than I have ever seen in my whole life. So it's definitely shifting, but nothing, nothing near where, um, as you said, as the U.S. is. Um, <laughs> just an example, not to like... Um, uh, bury myself in, in this, but uh, yeah. So when I go back to Japan, here in the U.S., I can wear a size small, but when I go back to Japan, I have to wear like an extra large. Like that's how different the sizing wow. are. Well, just, to look, just, to, <laughs> just so you know, people can understand how different the things difference. are. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I hate going shopping in Japan. <laughs> but anyhow, I, again, I digress. Uh, so the difference. So the 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 beautiful thing about Japan is we're really a, a society, a culture of har what we call harmony, which means we really treat everyone very equally. J again, there's always outliers. There's always some historical things, but I'm just going to really um, kind of uh, paint yeah. the picture in, in, in generalizing it. So I apologize for those who know Jap Japan very well and might say, Nozomi, that's not 100% true. I, I acknowledge that. I'm just going to paint a very general picture here. Um, is is about family, is about harmony, is about really treating everyone equal. So a, a very famous story is that um, Steve Jobs, as you, as a lot of people mm -hmm. know, the founder of Apple, he famously wore the same clothes every single day. And that was inspired by seeing um, in Japan, when you go to like um, a factory, a plant, it doesn't matter what title or job you are, everyone wears the same uniform. Mm -hmm. So really everyone is very equal. You can't tell from just seeing them. So that's good, right, in a way, but also that, that there's um, a flip side to that. Is that which also means there's a saying in Japanese: the nail that sticks out gets hit. So if you stand out, that is not something that is um, valued. That you stand out, which means um, you do have the freedom of choice, but that that choice comes with a really big cost. Mm -hmm. People will not leave you alone, right? So Japan is a free country. Um, you can. You know, as long as you don't harm other people and it's not against the law, you, you can do whatever you want. But a lot of people don't feel that they there's an unspoken rule in the culture that doing whatever you want is not very um, welcomed. So it is hard to stand out. It is, it is hard to be the so-called authentic self, which is being very valued now, especially in, in the time that you're in talking about Marine. We, you know, before we started the recording, you, we talked a lot about Gen Z. And that's yeah. a big difference um, in today's workplace, even in countries like Japan, that the younger generation are really looking for purpose and meaningful work. And which means they 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 might not agree or align with things that were done how things were done in the past, um, and that's a very big challenge for the Japanese um, community culture and companies, um, and things are changing and they need to change because as we know creativity innovation comes from thinking differently doing things differently and but um japan is known for uh really well known for kaizen which is continuous improvement and that idea is very is a beautiful idea uh, but that is built upon keep on improving a little by a little and a little by a little so making drastic changes having a completely different idea is not really the strength of historically for, for so-called the Japanese culture. So on the flip side in the US, um, and, and actually let me step back a little, and, and that's part of the reason why um, I've moved to the US uh, to go to business school. So I had a career. Um, I know we 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 didn't get past my eight years old eight year old self, but um, after that I lived in Japan. I studied abroad. I studied in um, Hong Kong because I really wanted to learn other countries outside of Japan. Because when you're in Japan, um, not now, but when I was a student, when I was growing up, our eyes were always head towards either U.S. or the Western world, and I really felt like we what we were kind of 
um, not paying enough attention to the other Asian countries. And so that was something I really wanted to do. So I had the opportunity to study in Hong Kong. I also study in Europe. Um, that's another story I'll tell another time, but I spend uh, a lot of time in, in Germany. Anyhow, so um, I had a career in marketing and advertising in Tokyo, an amazing career. Um, but I always felt like talking about purpose, I felt like there's something missing. I felt like I love advertising, I love marketing, I love branding, but I and, and strategy around that. But I just feel like there's something more that I can that I want to contribute. I just didn't know what that was. Um, so I chose. I, I thought I want to um, possibly go into the nonprofit management world. Um, so I chose to go to business school to study that in the U.S. Um, that's what brought me to the U.S. And um, I thought I'll just be here for two years, which now is almost almost 20 years. Um, so it's scary. You never know where life takes you. Um, but the reason why I decided to stay was first because I wanted to experience working in the U.S. for a couple of years and go back to Tokyo. But what ended up happening was um, so I got a, a, a job after business school. Um, working for a major airline in the U.S. doing strategy work. Um, and it was amazing. It was such a different experience from being in Japan, where, again, things have changed since when I started. But when I was um, in Tokyo, if you're a female, even though you are hired you're, um, the same way that your male colleague is, has been hired, you definitely felt the that so-called glass ceiling, um, this is old, old days, but I would have to, I didn't have to, but again, it was kind of this, um, unspoken rule that if you're a female that you, and if you're youngest, the most junior in the organization on the team, you serve tea every morning, I guess in, in, in other worlds, it would be, you're serving coffee, um, to your boss or to your colleagues. And so I did that, which I didn't question it ever because I thought that's the that's what you do and also that was you know I, did, I didn't want to create trouble um, I didn't want to rock the boat so I, I did what was kind of expected of me um, and I was very ambitious at that time so I, I really wanted to do all, um, work really hard be successful but sometimes that ambition didn't um, was not accepted well um, and I, I did get harsh words. It wasn't really easy. So when I came to the States and after business school and then joined a global organization here in the U S it was amazing that it really, at least it, it, from my perspective, it didn't matter. Like I could really do whatever I want in the way I wanted to, I can go after positions that I wanted. And that was a lot of freedom. I didn't feel like I had to pretend to do things in certain ways. There were other challenges, but, um, it was very freeing for me and, um, really felt like I can be myself because there's so many people show up in different ways. And also I can choose what I wanted to want to do. So that actually, um, has been something that I'm very passionate about working and helping, um, other people, especially Japanese women. Um, because I was, I am one of them and I was in their shoes to really help them to recognize that what you think you should do is what, what we, what I call the should track is really just a should, but there's other ways, there's other options. And each of us have the power to choose and you don't have to do what you think you have to do. So that's something we, we teach and, and train. Um, and I talk a lot about, um, through our leadership programs and our, in our coaching that we do. And that, so going back to, that's the big difference that I see between the U S and Japan. So they both have, you know, you know, their strengths and gifts, but also there's, you know, the, the flip side of that as well. And I can understand why you do what you do now because of your own journey. You you really experienced that firsthand, and that's that's really uh, incredible to hear and see. And uh, so, since you talk about and you stand for boundless leadership and leaders, 
um, having lived in different countries, Europe, Asia, um, US, <laughs> can you describe like what the ideal boundless leader look like? Like just in your experience, like just, and, and you know, maybe like a, your wish list or combination of what um, to be a truly, truly global operator, because we've seen people that are uh, very focused to like to US focused to German focused to Japanese focused and sometimes they don't operate well in other regions of the world but if we talk about somebody who can be accepted across all of those cultures and regions what does such boundless leaders look like what do you call a boundless leader yeah thank you so much for asking that question um because this is as you as you said, is so, so, so important to me. Um, so what I define as a boundless leader, the the really the heart of it is someone, and when we and actually, let me step back up talking about leader. So when we say leader, boundless or not, <laughs> when we say leader, really, my definition of leader is not someone who so-called has a team or has a title. Each person, even if you're a five-year-old, 100-year-old, we all, each person is a leader. Because the truth is you're living your life, which means you are a leader of your own life. Leaders are the ones that have a vision, clearly or not, is, a, is another story, but you have a vision, you have a want, you have a desire, you have a will, and you take action towards that. So as long as you're breathing, actually, you are a leader. And the first step actually that we we teach and what we recognize is that a lot of people don't realize that goes back to that choice, that they don't realize that they are a leader of their own lives. Um, so that's step number one. Um, and when it comes to boundaries leader, so what, again, the heart of it is really leading with humility, mm. knowing that each of us, and that comes from a place of knowing that each of us has a gift, a strength, um, something. There's a reason why we're here. And really knowing that, that I am not able to live on this, on this earth, in this world, universe, whatever you want to call it, all by myself. I am not... Um, I am myself does not complete this world. All of us together, because we're all here together, this world is a better place. And really knowing that we can learn from each of us, just as a lot of times I hear parents say, oh, I learned so much from my child, right? You're not, so you can learn from every single person, even if that person is different. And even if you don't agree with that person, you can learn something from that person. And and I say person, but that can be, when I say lead with humility, it, it means to respect and celebrate those differences or, or similarities, commonalities of people and also things and things around you. Um, even, and, and this is actually comes really from, a lot of it comes from the Japanese culture. For me, that comes very naturally, is that Japanese um, really uh, respect everything that we have. We, uh, we, we are a nation, <laughs> not to be a spokesperson of Japan, but we are a nation that has very limited natural resources, which means we have to really, you know, cherish everything that we have. So we don't like to waste. So if you think about the Kaizen, if, if people who are, you know, understand that philosophy, it's really about how do you lim eliminate waste? I mean, how do you maximize and keep on leveraging what you have? Um, so the same idea of like, which comes from a place of respect, right? Respecting everything that you have, like the desk, this microphone, the energy, the water, the air, everything that you have around you, really respecting that. But that has to have to come to a place of knowing that I, I can't survive and, you know, do everything all by myself. Um, so that leading from humility is really the the heart of that in that respect. Um, with So boundaries leaders, if I kind of speak more in that kind of leadership language, is really the leader um, that can build trust 
with other people, which means build relationships and really, again, respect and honor and celebrate others who can co-create these solutions to make whatever it is, a be- make it better. Right. So in in kind of corporate world, it will be, we'll talk about innovative solutions, people that can a leader that can inspire positive contributions and do this at speed and scale. Um, and because in today's world, I really believe, and this comes from, you know, being an observer of the world, but also from studies, everything that we've, we've, um, studied and, and the research that has been done is that today's leaders really, we need people with agility, adaptability, and people that can unlock diverse intelligence. And there are three elements to the boundaries leadership framework. We call it the three C framework. Mm-hmm. The first one is capacity. So capacity as as a human, right? If you are so stressed out and you're all about you know up to your up to your you know limit, then how could you connect with others? How can you care for others if you can't you know care for yourself? Um, that's like a very um, Typical example that I think most of us probably has heard is you talk about like you have to put the oxygen mask on you first before you help others. That's the capacity part is really the inner work. How are you doing the work? Because a lot of times when you get triggered by something, right, when you have conflict with someone else, for example, sometimes that a lot of it is a mirror. Right. That trigger is not so much about the other person. It's about something inside of yourself that is triggered. Mm-hmm for example. So that work, right? You have to do that inner work to be able to um, be a, be the better person, be the best person you can to be able to serve others, to be able to, able to have that capacity to see the beauty in other people, see the gift in other people, to be able to celebrate, to be happy for other people, right? A lot of times people that are not happy want other people to be just as unhappy as you, as they are. Right. So um, there's a lot of, you know, that kind of traditional wisdom there, but so that's where the capacity comes. It really starts from there. How can I, as a leader, build more capacity as a human to be able to serve others. Um, And then only from there, can you start seeing again, that strength and beauty and gift and celebrate others, others um, strengths. And that's what we call the the third, uh, second C is collective wisdom. So there's so much collective wisdom in this world. I actually was doing a work um, a workshop for a company yesterday, <clears throat> excuse me, which had about 150 people. It, it was virtual in the room. And there was so much wisdom there. I was just there to be a guide. So that's what leaders are, guide facilitating the amazingness that's in this group, in this room. There's so much already answers in there. Just like my example about that I shared about the bathroom incident for me at eight years old. I just needed to ask the person next to me. The answer was there. That's part of that collective wisdom. So that's the the second C. And f- the and the leaders that are able to really um ignite the collective wisdom can leverage it and then start co-creating mm-hmm. and that's the third c so co-creation so right co-creating solutions again we can't do everything by ourselves especially in today's world where there's so many things in the old days because i do come from old uh old school leadership you know because i've been in this world a little bit longer is that it used to be leaders typically, and especially in organizations where people that have already done it before. So we talked about, oh, in my, you know, I, this is the best way to do it. So you all do it too. Was like, you know, follow me, like do what I've done. So those base, best case, like case studies. So what's the best case scenario? You know, let's, let's follow that. Today's world, everything is new. You know, we've, I think most of the people were hit by that, especially experienced it through COVID, knowing that everything is new. You don't know what's, there's no example from the past that we can follow, which means the leaders, even if they're the head of a department or the company, they don't know what the right answer is. So really you have to bring in all the collective wisdom and decide, co-create solutions together. And ultimately there is a decision maker possibly who has to say yes, but that all comes together. And so that's what I what um, we call what a boundaries leader is. And I really, really, truly believe that the world is, is, is calling for. And that really connects with, Marianne, what you talk about, a leader that cares. 
Um, and, and that, so that's why, you know, with a three C, the capacity is such an important part because if you don't have that, you can't do, you can't really care for others. No, I love what you said, the capacity, the collective wisdom and the co-creation really it's, uh, yeah. thank you for sharing that framework of, um, really the boundaries leadership in your experience, how can caring leadership transcend boundaries when it comes down to creating a really diverse global high performing teams in a remote world a remote yeah region. so the interesting thing is um so again i'm just going to kind of compare to kind of how it used to be so it used to be in the old days they would say oh if you are working with a japanese this is how they communicate. This is how they think. This is how they do things. Oh, if you're going to work with someone from um, the UK, like this is how they are. Oh, if you're working with a Dutch, this is how they are. So they would kind of group you in these country cultures and that they would decide that's how you kind of think and operate. The truth is we are, each of us are different right? I could be Japanese, but the Japanese next to me is not exactly like me. We don't share the same, you know, ways of communicating the values and, and operate. So when in today's world, especially um, when things move so quickly, and especially with global teams, most of these teams don't have actually have never met in person. They work virtually, they work remotely, and things move so quickly. So a lot of things used to be linear. So you finished this like part one and then you moved to part B and then you moved to part three, uh, part C, which in today's world, a lot of the projects, everything is uh, working simultaneously. So it's the speed is so much faster than it's ever been before, which means you can't like um, say like, oh, because so-and-so is Japanese, so-and-so is Dutch, so-and-so is English, so-and-so is Bulgarian, so-and-so is, you know, um, Chinese. Like, you don't have time to categorize and work like that. You really have to um, face that person as a individual person and get to know the person quickly in a meaningful way. Yeah. So that's really... Um, when we talk when we talk to leaders you can't rely just on the knowledge that you have you really have and that goes back to um about leading with humility is that humility which means actually you have to be curious about other people right because you if if you know that other people have gifts and that you want to learn from them you want to get to know them that's curiosity so one of the the important skills or that we really emphasize on to be a boundaryless leader is to be a cultural learner and not a critic. And what I mean by that is, again, learners are curious. We don't judge. We don't assume. We want to learn. But critics are all about judging, right? This is right. This is wrong. Oh, they're, this is their shortcoming. They didn't do this in the way that I would do it. So that's a big part of how to, even if you don't know who that person is or meaning their, their backgrounds or values, you don't have that time to, you know, sit down and, you know, spend years and years and years to get to know each other by curious, by asking questions respectfully and kindly and caringly is, is one of the um, quickest way to create that meaningful and trusting relationship with people that you will work beyond borders and, and boundaries. Well, you know, thank you for sharing all of this. Uh, in Since I had the privilege to work for many years with a number of organizations and uh, incredible teams, S a simple question that often helps a lot of leaders is, how to best work with me, for example. If mm, you are, I love that. Yeah. You know, like and if everybody in the team writes it down and send it and share it within uh, the team itself, it's incredible the kind of impact that you can, because you say I have a daughter or a son and I am picking them up between four and five, so I can respond to emails after six or after seven. So people will respect and know that you have a particular things that, which is my next question, you know, um, <laughs> does leaders who care or boundary and boundaryless leaders 
should have boundaries as far as how to take care for themselves. <laughs> yes, so. absolutely. So the uh, so uh, that's a great question because sometimes people will get triggered by the the name boundary less leaders because of, does that mean like I don't have any boundaries or or, or advocating for having no boundaries? Mm. No, that is absolutely not the case. Boundary less it does not mean that you don't have boundaries. What it what we're trying to say is that um so the amazing thing about boundaries which opposed to uh, borders is that borders are a line. If, if I, if, if we say on a map that is typically set in stone for a while, right? It's, it's written. It's very clear where the, of course, things um, with the war and everything, the, those borders change, but it's something that is settled. It's, it's set. And if you look at the map, I look at the map, I know where the border is, right? We, we can see it. Boundaries are things that shift constantly. Like even, Marion, your your boundaries, like you said, like, uh, you know, I, I have to pick up my kids at five, so I won't, you know, answer any emails or, you know, I won't have any meetings after five. That might change next day if there's or some something that really important comes up and it's like, this is an exception or this one, because this day I'm actually able to, or maybe your kids, you know, their, their schedule changes or your value, you, you, what's important to you in that, in that next year might change, or just because a relationship you have with that person might change, but you have the power. I, you have the power to decide where that boundary is, which is different from borders where, where you have to agree on where the border is. So boundaryless leaders means that people that actually have the power and that clarity and again that capacity and know and ha know that they have the power, right? The power to choose is really what boundaryless leaders are. So absolutely yes, you have to, you need to know what your boundaries are and the clearer you can communicate that, the easier it is for other people to then be educated in understanding and respect those boundaries. And if it's something that doesn't work for them, you can talk about it, right? If it's something that like, it's not it's not right or wrong in a sense of it's right for me, but it not might not be right for you, then let's talk about that. And that's where we bring in the idea of having a healthy conflict. But healthy conflict too has to come from a, a, a foundation of trust, which, comes from having you know well, having that respectful relationship talking about the boundaries and the yeah. personally how do you take care of yourself you know in order to be your best self and be resourceful to others yeah um, how do you kind of manage those boundaries for you and how do you recharge yeah so i personally um for me it's really having a lot of um, quiet time, personal time. Mm -hmm. So some things that I do and I really um, call it my sacred time is that actually in the, in the mornings, I do not take external meetings at all, at all. So my team knows that every meeting needs to be scheduled after noon um, in my time. So in the morning I have a, a, a what do you call it? Um, rich, I, a, Ritual sounds really heavy, but I have a routine. <laughs> yeah, routine that um, I, I I wake up, I journal, and then I meditate, and then I take a walk. And some days I will do yoga or or work out, uh, basically moving my body. And then in the morning, I typically do work with myself. So that creative time, Maybe. thinking time. So that's how I recharge. And even on the weekends, I typically do not go out um, at night um, because I know I get really exhausted. <laughs> um, and then on the weekends, so one day I will do something with you know family and people, but one day as, as much as it is possible, I'll, I'll keep it to myself if I can. Obviously there's, you know, there's sometimes I can't, but um, I will carve out time for myself. Sometimes I'll go out to a coffee shop, you know, even if people nice. are, you know, friends at home to have that, that personal time. And Zoe, thank you so much for sharing all these insights. The final question for you yeah. is, if you have all the resources in the world, literally unlimited, boundless resources, as you yeah. 
but infinite resources. What is one thing that you'd love to change to make the world a more caring and more compassionate place? If I had all the resources in the world, I would really would love to help people to know that each person is truly loved. Hmm. And well, so that might mean, you know, in some way for some people that might work through uh, therapy, like all that, like, you know, different ways for different people, but I would love them to know that they are loved and they're not alone. I love that. What a great, great message and ending, you know, in, uh, in my uh, really belief and uh, I want to kind of affirm to your wish and hope um, that is true actually um, and we know it by the sacrifice of the greatest care of the world which for me is Jesus personally and uh, he did it for all of us that just for everybody to know in the world that they are loved and there's somebody who made that sacrifice um, and they just need to um, tap into that and, and uh, really um, feel, experience, in, often in the most difficult times that that happens. So uh, thank you for such a wonderful message to the world. And uh, yeah, be, be known that you're loved. And uh, if hopefully you find that love and expression in this world through through the interaction with the human with your human fellows and and uh relationships thank you yeah. so much for being here this morning Lomi, and uh blessings to you your family your work and uh stay well and thank you for being here this weekend. thank you so much Mary. it's such an honor thank you lovely i i, I really um really enjoyed that conversation and thank you uh thank, thank you. you so much I, i'm sorry i'm really long-winded that's 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 my bad so i, I apologize <laughs> it got probably a little bit longer than you wanted to no 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 not at all i think it was uh, i really enjoyed it and uh i appreciate appreciate everything you, you do i mean it would be lovely to um continue and have a follow-up uh, discussion i see a lot of opportunities to uh to create co-create as you say and create yeah. a world. I, I love your your vision your concept and uh um yeah let's um let's organize a follow-up call uh with yeah. call and get Gemma to to do that and okay to even host you here in the uk uh thank you and travel around the world so I almost, I almost was going to the UK actually this fall. I ended up not. Um, instead, I'm going to Dubai. But um, yeah, so I. But UK is one of, uh, one of the my favorite countries to visit. So hopefully, very soon, I can. And um, Marion, I would love to learn more about the work that you're doing. Um, so quite. please, I, I think there's yeah. a lot of uh, really synergies, and I think there's a lot of great things that could be shared and uh, leveraged and discuss and even co-created so i'll yeah. ask you to coordinate and uh, in the okay. meantime, have a fantastic uh, really less than best yeah. of you and uh thank you for taking the time yeah thank you marion have a wonderful rest of your day you. take care